this small chip does what it used to take a huge computer to do. Its story dates to a year that David Pogue reminds us isn't exactly known for its good times. In many ways, 1968 is famous for its tragedies, assassinations, conflicts, and war. But 1968 also gave birth to something amazing, the era of fast, cheap, ubiquitous electronics. Because 50 years ago, this past week, two middle-aged engineers quit their jobs to start a new company called Intel. In 1968, Gordon Moore dropped by Bob Noyce's house. Bob was mowing the lawn. <laughs> they were discussing the state of their current jobs, as well as the possibility of a new industry. We're Elizabeth Jones is Intel's archivist. She runs the Intel Museum in Santa Clara, California. And uh, apparently Bob said, yeah, that's a good idea. I, he did. And on July 18, 1968, Intel was incorporated. At his previous company, Fairchild Semiconductor, Noyce had co-invented the integrated circuit, a way to etch all the circuits in that era's room-sized computers onto a tiny slice of silicon. We have Intel's first product. It's a memory chip called the 3101. Okay, and before that, how did they make memory? Um, it's this larger device up on top called core memory. Smaller also meant faster and easier to make. This plant near Portland, Oregon, one of Intel's oldest, is what a chip factory looks like today. No TV crew has ever been allowed inside before. Do you have this in a khaki? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Aisha Evans, Intel's chief strategy officer, showed me how to put on the so-called yeah, bunny suit. Uh, that's her on the left. I did take a thorough shower this morning. Why, why was all this necessary? We want maximum purity as the material is being assembled. Each shiny round sheet of silicon fits about 500 identical chips, which will be cut apart and installed into the microprocessors, the electronic brains, to control just about everything in our lives with an on switch. Each chip is etched with impossibly small channels of circuitry only 10 millionths of an inch wide. And so who gets to etch those tiny, t is it some little Swiss watchmaker with a magnifying glass? <laughs> Robots. So, so how would you say the making of silicon chips has changed in 50 years? You know what? The basic principles and fundamentals haven't changed at all. Just a lot more automation, a lot more complexity, and also more layers. I see, and that's to get more circuitry into less space. That's exactly right. Getting more circuitry into less space is the whole point of Moore's law. That's Gordon Moore's prediction, way back in 1965, that we'd be able to double the amount of circuitry, meaning power and memory, that can be crammed onto a chip about every year and a half. He's basically been right for all 50 years. Now, you know that Moore's law is actually not a law of physics. It's, it's the result of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people making ongoing improvements in reducing the width of these lines that are printed on the integrated circuits. John Doerr started working at Intel in 1974. Today, as chairman of Kleiner Perkins, he's one of the world's most successful venture capitalists. Yeah, someone once said if this applied to automobiles today, cars would cost a few pennies, they'd get thousands of miles per gallon, and we, we wouldn't even remember where we parked them. We'd just leave them there again and get another one. In the beginning, Intel made computer memory, chips for storing information. But things really took off in 1971 when Bob Noyce invented microprocessors, that is, chips that could process information. And then, with this tool for modern times, IBM came along. IBM chose to base its personal computer on Intel's architecture. And had IBM chose some other company's chip, Intel probably wouldn't be here today. The makeup of the company started with, with the founders. And they said these simple words back 50 years ago, don't be encumbered by the past. Go and do something wonderful. Bob Swan is Intel's interim CEO. And, and there's another saying um, that associated with this company, which is uh, only the paranoid survive. We're always looked at, always worried, always curious, who's doing something else? And if we're not worried about them, 
they will catch up to us. It hasn't all been smooth sailing. The company famously missed the boat on making the processors for smartphones like the iPhone. Then, as PC sales began to slip, Intel had to lay off thousands of workers over the years. But today, Intel says it's determined to be ready for whatever comes next. The company is investing in self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, and other futuristic tech. Like drones. That's Anil Nanduri's division. His team specializes in making elaborate, automated, flying light shows, like this one at the Winter Olympics in South Korea. What we're seeing is hundreds or thousands of this actual drone, right? This is the exact drone that flew at the Olympics uh, in Pyeongchang. There's no cameras or anything else. It only has an LED light. A week ago, in honor of Intel's big birthday, his team set a Guinness World Record. Over 2,000 drones flying simultaneously, forming these images in the night sky. And every single one of them contains a tiny rectangle of etched silicon, like the ones designed by Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore half a century ago.